Uh, we're going to get started with the next part of the program, which is uh, kind of something that we are trying for the first time. So sorry, guys, if, uh, if you kind of uh, become the scapegoat of this experiment. But uh, that's how we learn, right? Uh, so the next uh, thing that we have is uh, kind of trying to make it a little bit more fun and inclusive by you know, having people ask questions they might have for the jQuery Foundation. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, the three folks we have from the jQuery Foundation, Dave, Chris, Scott. And we have... You're going to see keynotes from each of these guys. You're going to get their detailed introduction. I'm not going to go into detailed introduction right now. Most of you probably know them. Uh, we do have one chair that is left empty. Uh, the reason for leaving that chair empty is if uh, any of the questions that are asked to uh, the panel here, you feel they have not done justice to the answer, then I would encourage you to please come up, take the chair, and try to answer the question. Right? And trust me, we've done this kind of a thing before, which is like a fish bowl, uh, where anyone can come and participate. And we've actually seen people give really good answers. And you know, it's, it helps everyone out here. So again, would encourage you guys to take that empty seat. Uh, you know, these three guys are going to be stuck. But if anyone wants to come take the seat, answer, go back, we'll leave the seat for someone else. All right? So we try to model this on Aapki Adalat. How many people are familiar with that? Hopefully, everyone should be, because that's been the longest running uh, you know, like reality show, in some sense, on the Indian television, uh, some 11 years plus, maybe more. Uh, so just for the benefit of uh, everyone here, what, what we're going to do is we're going to accuse these guys for <laughs> committing certain mistakes, certain, uh, creating certain problems for the community. And we want to see how they're going <laughs> to respond to that. Uh, but before we get into this, uh, let's put the disclaimer out. Uh, I know there are people who believe that jQuery is no longer required. We've kind of moved way beyond it. Uh, but it doesn't matter what you think today. Without jQuery, I don't think the state of the web today, what it is, would have been this. Right? So again, thanks to these guys for really <laughs> making the web an awesome experience, right? I mean, let it be standardization, let it be trying to deal with all the uh, compatibility issues with the browsers, standardizations of certain things, making, uh, how many, do you, do you guys have any count on how many uh, plugins exist for jQuery? I think infinity. <laughs> Yeah, according to the blog post I see every month, there's 100 best plugins every month, right? You, you do a search on Google any time, and you'll see, if you just search for best jQuery plugins, you'll see a ton of, of articles, blog articles, most of them spammy. And they're all the best, right? <laughs> I don't see how there could be 100 best plugins like uh, of the same kind. But Th That's because you guys did an awesome job. I guess so. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm going to get started, and then uh, I'm going to open the floor for people to ask questions. So I'm going to get started with a few teasers, uh, and then hopefully everyone else will chime in and ask questions. So keep thinking about the questions you have, the accusation, uh, uh, accusations that you want to make on the jQuery Foundation. Uh, we'll get started with the first one, which is kind of a little fun and easy one. So we'll see how you guys respond to that. Uh, so I believe jQuery Foundation and the jQuery Project uh, is a nonprofit and uh, open source project. Uh, but the alias that you chose for jQuery is dollar. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why not like an underscore? <laughs> All right. Well, it, it's a historical reason, actually. Um, dollar was used originally by prototype. Uh, the prototype library. So when it came time to choose a character, obviously one of the things about jQuery if, that everyone likes is its brevity. They want the fewest number of characters you have to type. And if you go back and see John's original post from late uh, 2005, before he actually had the name, he was talking about how he could remove the number of characters. And um, he liked the character dollar sign, but it was taken by prototype. And that's why there's a jQuery.no conflict, because you can use it with prototype, and they can, you can use jQuery 
as something other than dollar sign. Okay. So is that okay with everyone? <laughs> so we can forgive these guys for doing <laughs> that. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, JavaScript in general, uh, people get confused the heck out of what does this mean in JavaScript. Like this, in so many different contexts, this could mean at least three different things. And then jQuery came along and added a fourth meaning to it, uh, right? Which is basically, if you're inside a plugin, then this essentially means the element on which you call the plugin. Now, that's, at least to me, not, uh, not very obvious, and it kind of confuses even more. So how could you guys afford to do that? Yeah, Scott. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, so when you're inside, um, of a method. This is actually funny because my answer was going to be that you're inside an instance of jQuery, so it should be that this references jQuery, jQuery instance. instance, but that wasn't true. <laughs> um, I actually don't know the reason for this. I do know that all the original methods were not on a prototype, and uh, who was it that I told him? Uh, David? Uh, Michael Geary. I Michael Geary. Uh, so yeah, J jQuery originally did not use a real constructor and did not have a prototype, and there was just a collection of methods, and all the methods got copied onto the object that was created. Yeah. As, yeah. Um, so the the answer I have is not true. <laughs> so I actually have no idea why why that's the case, but it makes sense today. I, I think the reason why this th there's fads that happen. So. In 2005, 2006 time frame, all the JavaScript developers were like, this, what a cool idea. Everything should be so object-oriented. So like today, this is something that everybody wants to avoid. So like, you know, arrow functions, you know, the this is, is inherited because nobody really wants to, to use this. And in fact, there's all kinds of other new ways that people can bind a different this because it's kind of inconvenient to always have it be one value. But at the time, that was the exciting thing, right? This in a plugin was going to be the jQuery object, and this in a handler, or in most other cases, was going to be a DOM element. Now, you have to remember in 2005, 2006, most developers were used to dealing directly with DOM elements. They weren't thinking, they were using jQuery on top of it, and they were happy that it was shortening what they had to type, but they weren't scared of the fact that that they were working directly with DOM elements. So uh, some of it has to do with history. jQuery was so successful that we think of this as for most of the time as being a DOM element, but it's amazing how many people don't even use it as a DOM element. They wrap it in dollar sign this because that's just the way they've been taught. Okay. Scott wants to so, add so I guess that actually depends. Were you talking about within a jQuery plugin itself, this being the jQuery instance, or within like a It will be callback? the element on which you call, right? Inside well, the plugin. It'll be the collection, the jQuery collection. The jQuery collection. Yeah. So, so that's what you were So that's about. a fourth meaning like that, you know, is confusing. Like a feature, a callback, right. or um, an event cases, listener. Yeah. Then you have the DOM element itself. And that is mimicking the DOM. Right. For event handler, this that kind of takes us to the next question, which is... You mean accusation? Next accusation. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'm not good at this, as you can see. <laughs> uh, JavaScript and DOM are two different things. But I think jQuery has done a wonderful job to confuse people that they are the same thing. People were already confused. Everyone that hated JavaScript hated the DOM and they just thought that they hated JavaScript. So we didn't make it worse, we just didn't make it any better. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to get out of it. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. Plugin architecture, we, we already touched upon the whole plugin uh, ecosystem that exists out there. I think the fact that every day maybe there are at least a few plugins contributed, if not publicly, at least privately, uh, it's just amazing how easy it is for someone to go ahead and create a plugin. Would you agree? 
right? Even though you don't have inheritance or any of that stuff, just extending a plugin using the plugin architecture is just like amazingly simple, in my opinion. And I think that's a fantastic job that you guys have done. But then when it comes to having all these plugins, and then how do you manage dependencies and versions between them, and that's just become a train wreck, in my opinion. <laughs> so what do you have to say for that? We don't make it worse, we just make it bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. Um, actually, this kind of relates to some of the complaints that people have today where they say jQuery is too big and it should be split up into pieces, which is really going to create a, a problem just like you have with plugins today. But um, I don't think, when you're looking at plugins, I mean, you, there's, it's chaos out there, right? You have to be very careful about choosing the right plugins. You have to choose a well-maintained plugin that's well-behaved. And so if you look at something like jQuery UI, where it's a set of plugins that work well together, then you're pretty convinced that they'll, into the future, be well-maintained and they'll cons be consistent about the way they work. But when you go out and you look for the 100 best date picker plugins of 2015, a lot of those have been written by somebody who thought it would be fun to write one, and then they decide that they don't have time to maintain it. And when that happens, then yeah, it becomes a little bit messy for the person who starts depending on it for their project. <laughs> That's a separate accusation. <laughs> The whole rating and ranking problem is a big one, right? Like, how do you, how do you ensure, uh, through some type of community ranking or whatever, that what you, you know, like, if we're not the people who wrote that plugin, how do we assure that that plugin is going to be good for even a year or two years or five years? I'm sure you've probably had a plugin that you've used in one of your projects, and you say, "Oh, I found a bug," and you go to GitHub, and it's last updated four years ago and there's 15 or 20 or 500 uh, bugs sitting there untriaged and the person who owns the project is basically not working on it. So the, the problem there is that we can't control that, right? We, we don't really, uh, when you go to select plugins, you just have to be very careful about choosing ones that are, are well supported and active projects versus ones that when you search, you find a reference from 2011 that sounds like it's a good deal and then you start using it and realize 2011 it was a good deal but it's not in 2015. There are actually two problems here. Right? One is how do you choose which is a good plugin given that there's an ocean of plugins out there. The other problem is trying to understand if this plugin is going to work with this version of jQuery that I have and you know just managing the versioning between the plugins. I think those are two kind of boiling issues in some sense. Uh, which is a good problem to have, the fact that we have so many plugins, but I think at this stage, jQuery gets a lot of bad name for not solving that problem. And, and what's funny about that is if you look at NPM, which is sometimes touted as a solution to that, it's not a solution to that. I, if, you, if you have a complex uh, NPM project, just try to go and update all your dependencies one day, or, or see what happens when something several levels deeper in one piece that you depend on has incorrectly declared a, a dependency. I mean, we, we have seen situations like that where things just blow up. And uh, it's really just a question of which dependency hell you want to live in. You can live in the jQuery plugin dependency hell, or you can live in the NPM dependency hell. Um, it's a hard problem. Uh, you can see what, uh, all the way back to Windows, what they did. Uh, they had the same problem, and they did essentially what NPM does, which is they save every version of everything that you possibly used onto the drive, uh, which for a client-side developer, that really doesn't work. You can't tell your client, well, uh, I'm using three different versions of jQuery, so pull those in, and then I'm using two different versions of this same plugin, so pull those in. Uh, at some point, you have to rationalize those and figure out how to get, ideally, one version of jQuery. So. So is there something that as a foundation you guys are trying to do to address these two issues? I know it's, it's a hard problem, very, uh, I don't know actually if 
any other ecosystem has really, really solved the problem. Uh, but you know, the whole dependency management, versioning, uh, is, seems to be a hard problem, especially when you have a lot of contributors contributing things. What's, like, what, what is cooking up in the foundation to, to address that? Uh, so we just delegate to NPM for this. Uh, we just use package.json. That's what we use with the jQuery registry, the plugin registry. Um, that is now read-only. Uh, you had to use um, a manifest that was very similar to package.json, and you defined your dependencies and their version ranges. Um, and now we're just telling people to go use NPM, uh, and you do the same thing, right? You define your dependencies and their versions, and it's really up to the plugin authors to get those dependencies correct. Um, but it's hard to see into the future, so when you release a plugin, you know, it, the version range that you have may not be correct if it's liberal. So, so if, you're, if you declare uh, your, your own plugin, let's say a jQuery plugin, and you say, I'm, I I'm compatible with every version of jQuery above 2.0, then you're trying to look into the future, like Scott said. And, and you probably can't look that far into the future, because you certainly don't want to look beyond 3.0, because at each major version, there's a potential for breaking changes. So you have to be careful as a plugin author. If you're making a component that someone else will consume, it's much better to be extremely conservative about what version you need. Uh, otherwise, you can run into the problem of inadvertently breaking lots of dependent projects because they're using your project and you've declared a dependency incorrectly. Um, and uh, there have been some changes in NPM. The version 3.0, which is currently in beta, uh, is going to support a feature that we have been asking for, which is flat dependencies. So uh, if you use Windows and you try to pull in a lot of NPM projects, you probably notice sometimes it can create paths that are so long that they can't even be deleted, the project can't be removed. Uh, that's because right now it's a complete deep tree, even if there's duplicates. So the NPM 3.0 makes it so that everything will be maximally flat. It only creates subdirectories of subdirectories if there are conflicts and versions that can't be resolved at the top level. You can also say, as a, as a client-side developer, I don't want to include multiple versions of the same um, project because I don't want to have that extra uh, byte count in my, in my project. But those are coming in NPM, and we're trying, I think the entire industry, you may notice, for example, that a lot of people are not talking much about Bower anymore. I think the entire industry is trying to coalesce around NPM uh, because we don't really think we need to have five or six solutions to that problem. It'd be nice to have one really good solution. And then we'll try to solve the issue of um, education. I think it's primarily education to make people understand that they can't say I'm compatible with every version above 2.0 because they can't see into the future. All right. I'm going to pause. I'm going to turn to the audience if they have any acquisitions to be made. Before I continue with my list, I see one hand I going up. I see no over. hands being raised right now. <laughs> At least one person. <laughs> Darcy? Uh, well, just to add to that, I don't think that the, the, for the plugin registry, I don't think you guys necessarily have approached like maybe they make sense, but you can take um, like a concept of discoverability. So I don't need to go find a blog post that says this is the 100 best jQuery plugins out there. What would be great is if you did something similar to what Gulp and Grunt do, and you essentially search for um, plugins that are uh, uh, published to NPM but have some sort of you know jQuery uh, flag um, or keyword essentially. So NPM is doing that with ecosystems. Okay. So, so are you guys going to have a? There will be um, because this is a problem, right? So the thing is that Grunt shouldn't have to solve this problem, and then have Gulp solve the problem, and then have jQuery solve the problem. Instead, NPM should solve the problem once, and then you have a Grunt ecosystem and a Gulp ecosystem and a jQuery ecosystem, and it's all maintained by NPM. So when are you going to, I guess, moonlight the plugin registry then? When are you going to kill it? Uh, we'll we'll it's probably kill it right now. whenever um, enough people move over to NPM. <laughs> so so we, we, d we have information on the site, and we don't want that information to go away until there's a better resource. 
And so it will just linger in read-only mode until enough people move their plugins over to NPM. But I don't. Can you update a plugin that's already being right? So that package that's living up there is getting out of date if I'm updating on Git. Like yes, but the only thing that's out of date is like the README and dependencies, um, because so that information because it, is it's not it's not housing the actual files. It's just going to link off to GitHub or whatever site is exists for that plugin. Actually, I I think that the uh, our decision to eliminate our own plugin registry was actually uh, a sign of. Our, our desire to collaborate more with the other people in the industry rather than try to create our own solutions. So we could have headed down that path. And in fact, uh, had there been community support for it, we, we might have continued that. We, uh, when we launched the reg uh, plugin registry, uh, that was a case where we applied some, uh, some of our finances uh, with Adam Sontag to work on that plugin registry. And the blog post announcing it said, we would love for the community to come and help us because we wanted to do things like ratings uh, and rankings so that people would know what were good plugins. And we got really no uh, feedback from the community, no help from the community. That, and really, that open source needs that. It can't be something where we're the ones uh, just alone driving the pro uh, project because we just don't have the resources to do that. So. We decided that it was, again, better to, to look at other people who were working on those problems and try to support them versus trying to do our own thing, where we already knew that the community didn't have a sufficient interest to, uh, to put any effort into it. So you're not going to kill it anytime soon? You're not going to get rid of it? Because it's like out of date information, essentially. It is, but it's like there's tons and tons of plugins that are out of date as well that, that people still depend on. So I think, in, to Scott's point, in, until, we, until there's something better out there, it can, it, the fact that it's there isn't, I don't think, hurting anyone. We still are encouraging people to move to, to better solutions like NPM. All right, let's move on to the next one. Does anyone have another one? We're going to try and time box things to go a little faster. We, I know we only have uh, yeah. 16 minutes left. This is left. about the promises and efforts. Uh, I hear from many developers saying that jQuery doesn't follow common JSPEC of promises and efforts. Oh, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> I'll, I'll, Do you I'll, want to repeat the question just so everybody Yes, uh, it was about, pro uh, it was about uh, jQuery's deferred, um, deferred implementation. In, in jQuery 3.0, we have a promise A compliant implementation. Uh, if you use the subset that is currently being shipped with ES6, which is basically just a then method uh, and, and catch. Um, if, if you look back to when we actually put deferred in place, which was 2011, I think, it was quite a while back. And there still were a lot of things unsettled about exactly how that would fall out. Promise A didn't exist by then. Um, there was uh, Chris Zipp's, I think, discussion on that was, was out, but it was a very short, non-specific uh, set of things. So jQuery 3.0 will make it so that you can use Promise A if that's what you want. I would warn everyone, and this is, this is one of the things that I, most of the things I think like guaranteed async for resolution are great. But I think one thing that is going to trip up a lot of developers is the fact that errors are swallowed by default. You have, and if you go out on the internet and you Google for promise examples, you will find that probably 80%, and I am not lying, 80% of them do not properly handle errors. They assume everything goes well, and as we know in programming, it rarely goes well. So what you'll find is those examples out there, if you accidentally typo a function name, you'll say, nothing happened. And the reason why nothing happened is because an error was thrown and you didn't catch it. So it's really critical as you move to promise-based programming, uh, one of the things deferred did was it exposed those errors. Now, that caused its own set of problems, but with promise A, if you don't catch those errors, they simp simply disappear and you'll never see them. 
Uh, the native implementations have some browser support for showing you those errors, but most software-based promise implementations do not. All right, cool. You had a question, yeah? Uh, this is a thing of the past, uh, but I'm really curious to know that jQuery was supporting IE678 right down till early 2013. Why did it take us so long to shun them? And I mean, just to show context, how many of you have been given hell by Internet Explorer at least once in your lifetimes? <laughs> Thank you. It took us that long because people are still asking for support. Um, even now, um, people are, are saying, well, we need IE8 support. And, and we still provide a compat version that, that does provide IE8 support. But IE6 and 7 were still around, and that was a controversial uh, decision at the time because even though XP was on death's door, people said, oh, no, no, it's, you know, there's still a lot of it out there. But by the time we actually removed support for it, I don't think a lot of people felt like it was a major problem. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> you know, of course, none of us will use IE6 or IE7, and the people that we talk to won't use it, but that doesn't mean that there weren't still a lot of people, um, especially in certain countries. Right? I mean, you, you have to look at the worldwide usage, and if you're, even if you're cutting off, you know, only 1% of users, that could mean 20% of users within a single country. And at, when you look at the statistics that way, that's a terrible decision. Um, so it's important when, when looking at browser statistics and, and how much something's being used um, to, to look at many different markets and not just, not just complete worldwide usage and not just within a single country, but within many countries. Also remember that jQuery is the foundation for a lot of projects out there. You saw the numbers that Chris showed. Um, if, if we don't support IE8, then it's going to be really difficult for you as developers to support IE8. So your decision to not support IE8 may be fine, but if we make that decision for you, then you're going to have to go to your bosses or your clients and say, Sorry, but this is going to be 10 times more difficult because I have to do this all myself. And, and that would be something that people would definitely yell at us about. Yeah, that actually brings us to the next question, which is not really a question. It's actually an appreciation for what you guys have done. And this is something I wanted to point out. So uh, when you look at browser detection, uh, that's, that's a huge challenge today, I think. It, is that a fair statement to make, that browser detection, uh, especially in client-side scripts, is a huge detection, uh, is a huge problem? And I think one of the ways uh, jQuery solved that problem is by using feature detection. So you basically put in a little script, see if that works, if not, fall back. So you kind of have a feature detection instead of relying on the agent string or other kinds of mechanisms that are out there. And I think that's a really interesting and powerful way of dealing with that problem. How did you guys come, come up with that? Like, you know, who came up with the approach and how? I don't remember. It wasn't on our team. It was actually something that people were advocating to us. The, the early versions of jQuery used browser detection in certain cases. Um, I mean, the, the most common scenario that I can think of that existed all the way back to like even before people, even before jQuery existed, is um, detecting if you had to use add event listener or attach event. Um, you know, some people did the, the user agent string detection, but most people just check, you know, does attach event exist or does add event listener exist and just use the one that does exist. Um, and so that's the earliest example I can think of of feature detection. So we're really just taking that, um, and applying that same concept to any time that we hit a browser bug that needs to be detected. The time when that really hurts is when you have a, a situation where the only way to detect a feature is to actually put something into the page and measure. For example, if, you, if there's a problem with the way the browser measures margins, you can detect that with a feature. You insert something into the page and you see what the margins are and if they're not what you expect, you know it has the bug. But 
that turns out to be a very expensive thing to do because it can force layout and cause other issues. Um, but quite often, that just makes us, gives us more ammunition to go to the browser maker that's causing this problem and say, you need to fix this bug. That's gotten much easier than it was in the IE 6, 7, and 8 days because the browser makers usually don't want to hear from us when we have something to complain about, so they'll, they'll fix the problem to make us go away. Cool. All right, time for one more question. Yeah, I mean, you've been raising your hand, so that's it. So, uh, you want to use the mic so everyone can hear? So jQuery is used around like in 84% of the websites, right? And request animation frame has been there for a long time. But now you have been including it in the next version, right? And it's mostly said that uh, web animations are sluggish on mobile or desktop devices, and most of them use jQuery. So do you want to take the blame that for the web animation uh, sluggishness, jQuery was responsible? That's yeah, an acquisition. <laughs> I, I think that the reason why it took us so long, we actually tried using request animation frame, what, three, four years ago. And um, when we did, we discovered a lot of, of uh, bad assumptions by developers, essentially. What, what happened was someone would say, do an animation for 10 seconds. And we would use request animation frame to perform that animation for 10, to 10 seconds. And then they would have a set timeout every, for every 10 seconds saying, redo that animation. So the net effect was that there was a set timeout restarting the animation every 10 seconds, and then this request animation frame doing the animation. Um, it turns out that when the window is out of focus, request animation frame never fires. So if you kept the window out of focus for an hour, then it would queue up a bunch of 10 second animations and then when you put the window back in focus, all of those animations would cascade and try to run all at once. And that was because people had made bad time assumptions. They had tried to use a set timeout and a crest animation frame in combination, assuming that a 10 second animation would always complete in 10 seconds. And that's not guaranteed. So really the reason why we backed off and went back to set timeout for all that time was because there was too much code out there that broke um, in, in a way that we just felt like we weren't doing anybody any favor by letting it stay broken. Um, we hope most of that is gone now, but if it's not, uh, we have basically a backup so that when we see a window go out of focus, we'll clear the queue. But um, there, those are decisions we have to make all the time. When you try jQuery 3.0, and I, I urge you to do so, you will see code that you have break. And you'll be thinking, why did they break this? I'll be talking a little bit about this in my talk tomorrow. The problem we have is we can't give you the best practices and, and, and convince you to do things the best way without breaking some code you already have. And that's the problem we had there. In that case, we decided to wait. We said, well, let's hope that people fix this problem, and we'll come back later. But we either have to hold back on best practice and on performance in order to make it so that your code continues to work, or we have to break your code. And that's a tough choice. Yeah. All right, that's a very good answer. I think we have last uh, five minutes left. Uh, so we could take one more question, but uh, before that I have uh, not really an acquisition, but a question I, I want everyone to answer which is basically if you had a time machine and you could go back in time, what was the one thing that you would not do in jQuery? I have a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Your um, favorite one. I, one. Oh, well, I guess if I had to pick one, it would probably be Ajax. Our, our Ajax implementation, I think Scott would probably agree See, with this one. I was going to say that, but I wouldn't take the original Ajax out of jQuery. Oh, well, <laughs> but I, I think we both agree that the current Ajax implementation is extremely complex, and it's, it's one method call that tries to accomplish every form of communicating with the server. And by doing so, it makes it very difficult for the end user to figure out what's going on. And it also tries to make, uh, there's 
a term that we use almost as an inside joke called intelligent guess. And essentially, when jQuery tries to communicate with the server, it tries to figure out based on what the data looks like and what data type comes back, what it should do with the data. And inevitably, because of poorly configured servers or bad data or whatever, something goes wrong and the user doesn't understand why uh, things are working incorrectly. So uh, the idea of Ajax, we all know we need it, but the implementation of the API could have been broken up into smaller numbers of, of methods that were more specific to functionality and, and some of those options could have been turned into helper methods, for example. All right. Um, yeah, I, Ajax is the thing I complain about the most. Um, but I, th I think if I could go back in time and change one thing, it would be getting people to um, listen to me when I told them not to implement deferreds the way they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, th then we would have had no compatibility issues and everyone would be a lot happier. I think without, without browser support for some type of error handling, though, I think it would be, have been very difficult. We would have just never heard the end of that. Yeah, but we could have at least done what Dojo did and then not have strayed. Yeah, well, uh, un unfortunately, when you, when you lead, when you're that early on, I think there's a lot of design decisions. What came out of Promise A was very good, but it took three years, four years before it solidified. Promise A plus. I mean, by that point, every one of the things had been spec'd out. We were kind of trying to implement ES7 features three years before ES7, and it's always an iffy proposition to do that, so. All right, Chris? Uh, I guess I would say hmm, creating jQuery mobile separate from jQuery UI. Um, Oh, I, I, <laughs> I am. Um, Wait, can, can we extend this another hour? <laughs> uh, because now it's now we have to do a ton of work to bring them back together, right? Um, and it just makes sense to have uh, a single UI framework uh, or, or UI library um, that handles all of the widgets, um, and then jQuery Mobile can just be the separate framework bits for uh, page navigation and things like that. Um, and so that's what those projects are working on doing now, um, but it's been years of, of time where they could have been working together. All right, so we have Ajax, we have people listening to you, <laughs> <laughs> and we have not having uh, mobile and uh, jQuery UI as separate projects. Cool? All right, so we have time for one more question. <laughs> Go there. I think this shoot we have. Ah, right. What prevented uh, jQuery from uh, using namespaces? You mean JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't squarely blame it on JavaScript. You could always invent you your own namespace. You, like what so Dojo it goes did. back to the first question about this, this will not work with a namespace. That's the reason. Well, still, Dojo does get around it, right? I mean, they don't have this. So, so, yeah. if, so you want, <laughs> if you wanted jQuery to look like Dojo, then sure, and we would have never taken off. <laughs> Ooh, that's a strong statement. That's a, yeah. <laughs> that hurts at least one person in the audience. <laughs> All right, so this is the reason why they don't have namespace. <laughs> so you can get rid of this and namespace both together. We'll get rid of JavaScript. <laughs> All right, I think we'll go quickly here. One more minute. So will jQuery 3 use TypeScript or ES6? Uh, no, it won't. And, and the reason is because that would be a project in itself just to rewrite it. 
and it would inevitably be larger. And if there's one complaint everybody can always complain about till, till the end of time is jQuery is too big, which basically means they don't want to do their own custom build or that they don't really want to realize that that, that one megabyte image that they use as their hero image is significantly bigger than anything jQuery has in it. But, you know, the, there's no reason to rewrite, I mean, it would be cool to use all those features and it would actually shrink the size of the source and it would be fun to write, but it wouldn't make jQuery better in any way. So, no, we're going to stay with plain old JavaScript. It won't be transpiled. Uh, one more question, like uh, for jQuery uh, core, uh, so, like, unlike other framework like EXTJS or Dojo, who's why, asking like, the question? There's, like, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a question <laughs> coming from somewhere. Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who gave that man a microphone? <laughs> okay, so, like, uh, unlike uh, Dojo or EXTJS, why jQuery is not having a data, st data store concept? Like, store API, uh, REST store, or uh, like JSON store? Yeah, so jQuery doesn't have a data store, and that's because jQuery is a DOM library. So people, people have this misconception that jQuery is like a library for implementing applications and websites using um, JavaScript, but it's really an abstraction over the DOM, and then Ajax was thrown on top of it. Um, and so all these accusations that like jQuery does not provide a way to organize your application or it doesn't have, you know, X feature is, it, it's just misdirected, right? Like it's, there's no reason that a DOM library would have anything related to a data store. And, well, and there are very good libraries out there for that, like underscore. Uh, yeah, or Dojo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, use the, use the Dojo store just by itself with your jQuery code, and then you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just so, uh, <laughs> so this is like a legitimate thing to do, right? And really, Dojo 2 is probably going to work that way. Um, but, but that's the idea, right? You, Dojo is written in a very modular way, and it's designed for building applications, and so it solves all of your problems. You have request abstractions, you have storage abstractions, um, and then they, they have their dumb abstraction. And so, so you can use jQuery as your DOM abstraction and still use something else for your data store abstraction, something else for your request abstraction. If, and then you could completely get rid of Ajax from jQuery and then you don't have to deal with all the bad stuff. Um, so so J that's, jQuery that, this the is good like, parts. Yeah. this is like the, the proper way to use jQuery, right? jQuery, if jQuery is the thing that defines how your application is architected, then you're doing it wrong. And, and that's the truth, and it's that simple. So we get a lot of complaints about this, right? Like people start using jQuery for something simple, and then it just grows and grows and grows and grows, and then their entire application is nothing but document readies and event listeners, and then they say, jQuery is terrible for building applications, but really they just, they didn't actually sit down and figure out how do I want to build my application and then use jQuery for the DOM parts, they started with the DOM parts and just grew it until it was a full application. And you see this happen even with new, um, I want to say frameworks, but like with React. The Facebook guys say React is not a framework because it isn't. It's just meant for rendering views. And so you, you know, if you try to misuse a tool or if you just say, well, this is all I need, then you're going to find as you try to grow with it that it, unless you have some other way to organize the rest of what you need, uh, it's not going to work well. So I completely agree with that. All right. We are running out of time. So you guys did really well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just for the record, none of this was uh, rehearsed before. <laughs> so these guys came up with all the answers impromptu. So really appreciate that. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to the next part of the program, which is basically uh, kicking off the jQuery uh, hackathon that we have uh, in support of the Joomla project. Uh, I did talk about it in the morning. I just want to kind of touch upon a little bit of logistics so that uh, anyone over here who wants to participate in the hackathon uh, is welcome to participate in the hackathon. It's happening in the room right around the corner. 
Uh, it's called Esquire Hall. And what we're going to be doing there is uh, we have a bunch of people who've already signed up uh, for projects that they have. Uh, either they want to build those new projects or uh, ideas, or they have something already and they're kind of coming here to work with other people and take it to the next level. We're going to kick it off at uh, 2.15, that's right now, and then it goes on till tomorrow, 2 p.m. And then at uh, 5 p.m. tomorrow or 4.30 p.m. tomorrow, we're going to have uh, each of those people who've done the projects come here and kind of show a demo. Each person gets three minutes or five minutes, depending on how many projects are completed, uh, to showcase uh, what they have done. And then you guys are going to be the judges to decide who wins uh, the, the hackathon. It's kind of called a hackathon, but it's more than a hackathon, so it doesn't matter. Um, but the point is we wanted to get involved more people to come and do something at the conference as part of that, and that's kind of why the whole idea of hackathon came along. And then the folks from the Joomla project came along and they said, you know what, this is a good idea and we want to kind of support this. And that's how we got the Joomla project interested in the hackathon itself and to come and participate at the jQuery conference. So uh, with that, I'm going to call Saurabh from the Joomla project to kind of quickly come and talk about what you guys plan to do and kind of also talk a little bit about encouraging more people to contribute to open source because that's one of the themes that we have uh, is how can we make it easy for more people in India to contribute to open source. My pet peeve has always been that probably we have the highest number of developers in the world uh, as a country, but if you look at our contributions to open source community, it's probably minuscule. Uh, and maybe the jQuery Foundation can further uh, add some stats to it, saying how much percentage of it happens. In fact, I was talking to uh, the founder of Stack Overflow, and he was talking about, you know, the thing that amazes him is India has the highest number of hits on Stack Overflow, right? The highest number. It's, it's like if you, if you did a bubble chart, uh, India would basically encompass everybody else within it. Right? India has the highest number of uh, uh, hits on Stack Overflow and the least amount of contribution on Stack Overflow. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we, we have something called uh, SDT, Stack, uh, Stack Overflow Driven Development SDT, uh, <laughs> which is what a lot of people do. Google, just like Google, do that. Uh, but you know, what, what is preventing us from not being contributing to these communities out there? I mean, going and answering a question is not that difficult. I'm sure each one of you can do that, but something is preventing us. So there is a theme in the hackathon which we are trying to see if there are things we can do as a community to improve that, right? So I would encourage you guys to participate in it, and I will let Saurabh kind of talk a little bit more about the Joomla project itself and what you guys are trying to do. Thanks, Naresh. You can take this here. Yeah. Tim, I'll give him seven minutes. That's exactly what he has. That's a lot of minutes. So yeah, I will save a couple of them. I hope so. So meanwhile, like, as you know, Naresh was telling, like, we have so many people in India that we can contribute so many projects into, but still we are not coming up, and I s still see there are so much lack of, you know, interest, I don't know, maybe. Or maybe people are still, you know, hiding, afraid of, I don't know, with the community or introverts or whatever you call as. But I think you guys really need to go and, you know, this kind of events, come up with the new ideas and join and, you know, make the things happen. And that's what the open source is. Make the community, build something great, and move on. Make something better. So let me talk about one of the projects which I'm in, you know, interested in since a long time and working with, uh, which is Joomla, which is open source CMS. And before that, a little bit about me. I'm from Pune, and I love open source. I'm in, into open source since like almost eight years now, and I still love it every time I, you know, talk about open source. And I love travel and technology. I have been many of the events around the world, and it, it's like my favorite thing to do. But apart from that, uh, I'm a basically a Joomla-holic. 
I have never touched any other CMS. Of course, I have tried, but I have stick to one, and I, I still love it and always be. So I'm a board member of the Open Source Matters, which is kind of a organization which supports the Joomla project with the financial or trademark things and everything together. And a lot of you know, uh, team in Joomla. Also, I'm a representative of uh, Mozilla in my region. Of course, there are a lot of people, but I do volunteer my time in you know, another open source projects as well. So what Joomla is basically? How many of you have heard WordPress or any other CMSs? How many of you are already working with them? Blogging with them, I guess? Yeah? <laughs> so Joomla is the, another one CMS, you know, you can say, which is having a lot of community, so much popular for small kind of a business or a large or non-profit organizations. And clients love them because it's easy to manage. And we are trying to make them better with the community. We have so many, you know, so many people around the world which actually really do some things for open source projects. And Joomla is one of them which I have seen a lot of diversity you know, from different parts of the world. And people are coming in every, every city, I mean, wherever you go, and have those kind of amazing events and you know, join. So what are the features? Of course, it's a open source project. And people are, you know, multilingual, sorry come from different part of the world. And it's a multilingual you know, feature which we have uh, over 57 languages covered so far. And we still are growing. So if you're interested, you, know, you can join the transla translation team as well. Then we have a one click up upgrade, which you don't have to worry about you know, what the CMS does and everything. It just takes the rest of the things you know, itself. It has a help button in every page of your you know, pay, uh, system. So if you have any problem, you can just click and find something better uh, with all documentation. Also, a media management, just a one, one uh, folder where you can manage everything together. Then there is a banner management as well where you can have your advertisements and et cetera. Of course, the content management, so you, you have a lot of different parts you know, in the CMS which you can manage, but it's an easy way to manage there. Also, a smart search feature, nested categories, these are all, you know, uh, you have seen probably in many of the CMSs as well. But the best thing, you know, I have, I've talked about in many things and, I mean, many events, and what I've found, people are, ex you know, interested in building something called as extensions we, in, in Joomla. And these are many things I would like to talk here in Hackathon as well, as well as, you know, because you guys are front-end developers I see here, and jQuery, we are using, like, you know, throughout the project. And we are so much interested to get you guys into the project so we can, you know, get something better with the, so, um, the CMS. And we need help to optimize this code as well. So if you see any, you know, bugs, or if you have any t unit testing or anything you would be interested in, you know, I would love to hear from you and take help, you know, from this community as well. So, I'm not sure I have more minutes, but I'm almost done. So if you want to get started, you know, these are the two sites you can go. These are free, and you can just start, get launched, you know, this site, and learn about them. Also, if you would like to, you know, be a part of this community, you can just go to the volunteer portal, which we have, and just register there, and you can find everything over there. So let's talk about the hackathon. As Naresh said, you know, we have three different groups. But I would like to hear more from you guys as well, like what kind of ideas you have, what kind of things you can build, and you know what we can do with this hackathon, something interesting and something important out of this you know, event. And almost we have a one, one day, I, I hope so. So I'm interested in you know, all night long if you would guys like to sit here or something, talk and build something so we can do as well. And we do have to offer some you know, free goodies. We have a Joomla World Conference coming and it's in the same city, Bangalore, which we have previously in different part of the world, in Mexico and Boston and everywhere. And now this is the time, like it's in India. I have bring this to India because we have so many talented developers. And I would really like, you know, Indian people to get involved in the project as well. And of course, to the Asia people. So, and we have many great speakers, you know, lined up here and we are still trying to get more people, which probably you might know or all of you know. So if you guys are interested in this, I would love to talk and you know just find me. I want 
I won't buy it, I promise. So thank you guys. Uh, you can contact me, any of these you know, channels, if you would like to hear more. So thank you very much. And thanks so much for giving me time. Thanks, guys. So we're going to get started with the hackathon now in the Esquire Hall. Uh, so if you're interested in participating in that, please go over there. Uh, also, you can pop in and out. You don't have to be there throughout. So you could choose to go in, do something. Like, for example, there's a bug bash that Joomla is running. You could just participate in the bug bash and come out, and then attend the session, go back in, all right? So with that, we're going to close this, and now we're going to split the halls again and final discussions are gonna get started, right? Thank you again.